It's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Trish Walraven, RDH, BS. She's a dental hygienist, blogger, and software designer. After graduating magna cum laude from Texas Women's University, she spent almost 25 years practicing full-time clinical hygiene, including five years in the private practice of the Dallas County Chief Forensic Odontologist and 17 years in the office of Dr. David Rosen of the Colony, Texas, who we just had on the show uh, a few months ago. Um, which was featured in a dental town off visit a few years ago. In 2008, Trish founded Dental Buzz, a dental trends website and blog. And in 2014, she and fellow townie hygienist Erica Feldham collaborated on a Dental Buzz article about the blue specks that dentists and hygienists were seeing under patients' gum lines during recare visits. The news that these plastic microbeads were being added to toothpaste merely for color gained national attention with their awareness campaign culminating the signing of a bipartisan bill by President Obama in December of 2015 to ban the sale and production of products containing microbeads in the United States. Trish continues to write for Dental Buzz and is currently spending her time with Blue Note Software, LLC, a medical inter-office communication company that works with dentists, optometrists, veterinary hospitals, and other medical specialties to help offices manage the workflow of their offices with virtual flight panel systems, uh, my gosh, um, actually, the first I ever heard of that story was when you posted it on Dentaltown. I, I think I think you might have broke that story on Dentaltown. Well, actually, that's where Erica and I met one another. She was the one who had posted some findings herself. And I looked at that. She did some research, uh, sleuthing, just put her little science hat on and said, what is this? And she's the one that actually uncovered the fact that the plastic was there. Um, and the two of us collaborated together since I already had a platform of um, just awareness kind of campaigns. Um, we, the two of us created a story to uh, get out to the public that there was something that hygienists were seeing. And once it hit the hygiene networks and all of the, the uh, social media, that's really when it caught fire because I believe every hygienist in the United States at the same time realized that's what those blue dots that I'm seeing are. And so we literally connected the dots on uh, dental town and on hygiene town. And at that point was when um, they started uh, sending in emails and phone calls to Procter and Gamble to say, hey, this is not acceptable to us. So that's really how all of that kind of rolled. It was it was a effort really on um, a lot of fronts, different uh, social media hygiene uh, groups out there is what kind of spread that it just went viral for the most part. So looking back, um, are you glad that you did this? And are you, are you glad the beads are gone? I mean, what, what was your, what, what, what's your uh, summary looking back now? Hindsight being 2020 and we're almost, we should all be seeing very clear in three years, in three months, because in three months it's 2020. And that's when <laughs> everyone will see great. That's yeah, that's, and we don't, we keep hearing that all the time. Uh, you know, 2020 is, is the year of the um, eye care practice, right? You know, right. so. <laughs> but um, the as far as the beads themselves, absolutely. I think all of us are relieved of the fact that uh, there was enough of a uh, push from grassroots efforts to say this is not necessary in our products. There, there was the potential for it causing harm because there was an embedding that was happening of these beads. We were finding them down in deep um, periodontal po pockets, uh, just, you know, regular sulking also just and the fact that there's one less thing that are, is being in our mouths contaminating i guess is probably a good word to put that uh the better so the fact that all of the microbeads have been um banned in the united states from all products is uh good for our environment number one um they've basically qualified alternatives now natural products like walnut shells and and so forth that are used for um uh the abrasiveness. So yes, it's a good thing. Um, do you think that, um, it seems like the, um, the history of toothpaste as that they all came from the soap companies like Procter and Gamble, when all these companies realized they were already making soap and all these soap products and they just had to add fluoride to one and, and, uh, make a toothpaste. I mean, is that kind of your, 
uh, historical origin belief of toothpaste? I mean, is this, isn't this where it really all started? It was just soap, surfactants, add fluoride, tailor a product for the mouth? Well, yeah, I mean, the fluoride was definitely like an afterthought. The um, essentially, as far as what I know, I mean, just the fact that Procter & Gamble is a detergent company, um, it, it's no surprise that they make toothpaste because toothpaste base ingredients are soap. And that is, they had to find a way to make it a uh, therapeutic benefit versus just a daily clean, you know, so it really isolates it from ivory soap. I mean, this is not ivory soap now. It has a health benefit and that has uh, really evolved into almost like a, uh, a health in industry in and of itself. It's like uh, consumers now listen to what the toothpaste ads tell them about all the health benefits of toothpaste. And it's like, and if you use this toothpaste, it's almost like the undercurrent of what they're being told is then you don't need to visit the dentist anymore. But you know, um, Trish O'Hare used to always tell me that um, dry brushing is, um, that there's no really even need for toothpaste. I mean, to remove plaque. And uh, she was a um, she was a big dry brusher plan. Do you, and, and now it seems like most patients, the way they talk to you, uh, it, it's like one of these. Which one of these toothpastes is the secret ingredient? And I always say, you know, use whichever one that you'll use twice a day. And, mm -hmm. and like right. like like for me, some of those toothpastes are very nauseating to me. I, I have five sisters and a brother, so that's a pretty big genetic sample. And me and my sister Kayleen, we gag. Um, when when mm -hmm. we when we brush you early, and for me, uh, close up that red, you know, toothpaste. Whatever. For some reason, it's cinnamon. Yeah, for some reason that one, and the same with her. We both mm -hmm. like that toothpaste. And I say, you know what? Um, you don't even need toothpaste. Dry brushing is fine if, as long as you do it for two minutes. Just use the kind uh, that makes that that you like. Um, right. Do, do Do you have any um, um, favorites when it comes to toothpaste? I like baking soda. I actually like the taste of baking soda. I like the texture of the baking soda. The, the real, the real stuff Just, out of the I box. Will use, I will use. Yes, I have. I have been known to do that. Um, uh, if you use Profi uh, Jet Powder, it's baking soda. That's what I used to spray that on my toothbrush a little bit and actually brush with that at work. Um, but yeah, that's that's my favorite flavor of of clean. But it really does, and and I like anything that tastes like a um, a vanilla Tic Tac. So like the vanilla mint, I think those yeah. went away though. <laughs> but you're right, it is about um, flavor and acceptance of accepting a flavor that you will consistently use. You don't want to use something that's going to gag you out. Um, you know when you brush it. Now it's funny that you you like the close up that uh, cinnamon flavor. That's like the worst flavor. Too many fireballs. Right. <laughs> well, it reminds you of your fireball days, taking shots of fireball. Um, but, um, yeah. So, um, do you, um, is that basically, I mean, I mean, a lot of people push around, um, the toothbrush, a uh, toothpaste abrasive chart and they have the, you know, the very low abrasive, the low, the medium abrasive, the high abrasive. Um, do you, um, is that one of your guidelines on recommending or not recommending, uh, toothpaste? No, not believe it or not, I, that the abrasivity chart is, um, I mean, I'm aware of it, but as far as uh, telling people which to use or which not to use, um, I, I would say sticking to the major labels, most of them have, uh, and, and I know that Pronamel is probably one of the least abrasive toothpaste out there. So, and it is one of the big uh, toothpaste leaders. So you, you're less likely to find a high abrasive toothpaste with the, the standard ones. And probably the white whitening has a lot to do with not necessarily the ingredients, but the particle size. So the sil the hydrated silica that's in toothpaste will be adjusted uh, size wise. And even the shape of the particles, if particles are round, uh, they're less likely to be abrasive versus um, if they've been manufactured with lots of sharp edges that will increase their abrasivity. So that's, that's just what, that's all I really know as far as, um, toothpaste manufacturing. Um, I, this weekend, the news was being dominated as far as, um, dentistry, um, mouthwash use could inhibit benefits of exercise. Uh, did you see that one going around where, um, 
Uh, mouthwash use could inhibit benefits of exercise. Scientists have shown that the blood pressure lowering effect of exercise is significantly reduced when people rinse their mouth with antibacterial mouthwash rather than water, showing the importance of oral bacteria. Because, you know, when you're an athlete, um, they always teach you to breathe through your nose because when you breathe through your nose, uh, it picks up nitric oxide, which uh, dilates your lungs. And mouth breathing, you know, you have to breathe so much more, but that when you're using mouthwash, it kills a lot of these nitric oxide producing bacteria and it negates the benefit of cardiovascular, um, uh, that just rinsing with mouthwash negates that benefit. I thought that was, uh, um, talk about just more food for the um, oral health continuum of how the mouth and the body and everything's just all related into one mechanism. I I thought that was very interesting because out here in Phoenix, I see so many people when they're training for Ironman, put the, uh, the duct tape, uh, the, the Mm -hmm. big, the big, uh, is it duct tape, the big silver or yes, that's duct tape. That's duct tape. Or they just wear those masks. I've seen people wear the training masks too, right. To basically, um, continue that nitric buildup, the nitric uh, oxide buildup so that they're um, training in a level that's, I think that has more to do with just oxygen depletion than it has with anything because they're, they're, re- they're reducing their oxygenation. So when they don't have the mask on, when they're actually in the marathon or what have you, it's like being on uh, the surface of, you know, it's being at, like at one at sea level versus, you know, 20,000 feet as far as, you know, the oxygenation that their bodies are accustomed to. Yeah, I, um, I I thought that was very interesting how that study, and I read it, and I, I read the study, and I actually um, emailed the author, and uh, it's uh, it, it's really a serious thing. So so talk about Dental Buzz. When when did you start DentalBuzz.com, and tell us what was going on in your journey when you started that. Well, actually, it was uh, essentially a – I had a lot of opinions, and um, it was a matter of – putting those out there and saying, you know what, I want to start playing with words. I want to play with uh, the ideas that dentists have that may, maybe not in such a serious vein. Everything that we read on the internet, it seems like is all, you know, gloom and doom and seriousness. And it really just started as a, a kind of a humor uh place just to, to have fun and, and make fun of dentistry a little bit. Um, that's not where it's evolved though. Um, we still try to keep a bit of, of, of fun in there and, and keep it light. In other words, we're not going to handle like really serious life and death topics, but, um, it has become more consumer centric. Like this is accessible, not only to dental professionals and making fun of ourselves, but also we want you to, we want consumers to come into our world a little bit. It's like, kind of see what we are like on on our uh, more uh, playful days, essentially. And that's really where Dental Buzz kind of started, but uh, it has it has skewed in places that I did not expect it to go. It's been a fun ride. I, I, I've always enjoyed it. Um, your last one was, why dental insurance makes good people do bad things. <laughs> uh, what, what was your, uh, what was your and, and I love your, uh, how insurance work. You talk about uh, fire and property, you talk about death and life. Uh, I, I've never understood um, how how people um, believe in uh, in uh, dental insurance. I, I can't believe they buy their own house, they buy their own car, mm-hmm. but they think they're incapable of buying a major purchase. Like 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 say say you got lung cancer, okay, mm-hmm. or say you had to have a hip or any the catastrophic stuff. Everything you get catastrophic is still less than the price of your house. And, and you take so much more interest in buying your house and your car, but it seems like, like, like dental dental is only 5% of the budget. I have people that live next door to me in million dollar homes and they come into me and I'll say, they'll say, but, but, but I don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. And and you're just like, well, Mary, you, you live in a $3 million home. (laughs) And you have five cars. I mean, I mean, it, it's such a bizarre, but where, where were you going with uh, when you wrote uh, why dental insurance makes good people do bad things? Okay. So where I was going with that is not necessarily saying that, uh, 
the person working in the dental office, although it could apply to the person working in the dental office, but it actually makes consumers do bad things. And that was really my ploy there. It's like you are not, as a consumer, aware of the fact that that your uh, dental insurance is no more than a... Uh, uh, excuse for you to only go to certain doctors if you're in a PPO or um, and not and tell yourself, well, I can't afford the good dentist in town. And so this is that was a way to open that up to everybody and make them realize you are a valuable person and you need to go to the best dentist in town and not just the one that takes your insurance and just divorcing, having people divorce their beliefs from their insurance company and saying, you know what, you only have this much amount of uh towards dentistry anyway. And if you were paying for it out of pocket, your uh, your Delta is really only about 20% if you were just doing that yourself versus uh, you know expecting uh, somebody else. And you're more likely to get quality care that lasts longer versus being uh, forced into like an HMO type of plan where they have a uh, uh, the the only money that they make are the add-ons. You know, they get a stipend per month when you go to a, an, an HMO uh, dental clinic. And then anything above and beyond, they have to bill you for it. And people are like, it's just shocking when they realize that money, I could actually go choose the dentist and just pass that out. And we didn't even have to play the game of, you know, what umbrella am I under? Yeah, and... and it, what's amazing is is people. Um, I, I just love the examples where you use property insurance, you use fire insurance, and and how copayments are everything. And when you look at a uh, healthcare, uh, the the fact that Medicare, Medicaid, there, there's no copayment. Uh, people will go get a fifty thousand dollar knee replacement. They don't they don't even know the cost. But if they mm -hmm. just ha if they just had a five percent copayment. That's the first time they'd see that it costs fifty thousand, and then they'd get on mm -hmm. the, the internet and they'd find out, well, it's fifty thousand in Phoenix, but if I drive up to Flagstaff, it's only forty thousand. In mm -hmm. fact, I'm going to go visit my sister in, in Utah because over there it's four, and I'll, I'll save all this money. Yet when you tell someone that every single person on Medicaid, Medicare, insurance should have a copayment, they look at you like you hate poor people, and it's, and it's, it's like we, we have a hundred years. 200 years of hardcore science and economics. And it's just bizarre how um, some little thing like insurance and people just throw all their common sense out the mm -hmm. window. Uh, mm -hmm. Now they're a victim. Now, now you can live in a million dollar home, but you can't fix your tooth because you don't have insurance. And it's just, I mean, it's just, just, it just blows my mind uh, how b bizarre it is. Um, what um, you also um, work for blue note software. Uh, you're a consultant for Blue Note Software. Um, tell us about your journey. When, what were you doing in your life when, uh, uh, I know they're close to you. They're in Keller, Texas. Is that, uh, did, did you know them from just living in Texas together? Or how, how did your how did your journey end you up at Blue Note Software? How we ended up with Blue Note. Yeah, so uh, essentially Blue Note, um, I've kind of been along on the on the sidelines with Blue Note for, for years and years because uh, it, evolved in 2003, believe it or not, is when um, the company was established and it was a telecom company for uh, for dentists to uh, have phone systems custom built and installed in in their practices. So it was, it's primarily communications. Um, and then uh, I guess about 2000, probably about a year later was um, when they were doing uh, the 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 the, the Blue Note people, they weren't even Blue Note at the time. They were a different company. Um, they were uh, sitting down and doing a napkin sketch uh, because they were trying to figure out a better way for uh, dental offices to communicate the real times. They didn't want to put phones in the operatories. They're like, we need something else to communicate with. And this doctor is uh, hard against doing radios. We're not going to put anything in anybody's ears and we're not going to put the things on the walls. What can you do for us? How can you build something? And so the engineers were able to uh, just kind of mock up a few uh, ideas. They sent it out to the Southwest Dental Conference the next year, had uh, about 50 dentists sign up for it. It didn't even exist yet at that point. 
And that's really what got the ball rolling with, um, it is essentially a virtual light panel system um, that also lets you use your cell phones um, to, or, and your smartwatches to know real-time communications so that anybody in the office uh, can be have their, uh, their office communication, the real-time communication transformed into tasks that are visible and audible and essentially that's uh it's been growing since 2004 and so here we are now i joined them in 2016 and uh and is do, i'm doing some consulting i do some trainings with them um and my husband is one of the original developers so that's how i tie into it oh so your husband's a developer or programmer or yes he does he does the behind the scenes things for for blue note and so that's and then so that like i said i joined him about three years ago so how many um so is it only dental no it's uh de dental veterinary eye care um general medical offices uh primary care a lot of primary care clinics um use blue notes uh essentially instead of the buzzer system on the walls um for letting them know hey you know what we need a um a lab draw in this room we'll press a button we need that uh, we need a handoff to an optician we need a handoff to a front desk person you know for case presentation all of those kinds of things are basically tasked on a, uh, a like a, a virtual um, whiteboard or a, a dashboard and everybody is able to then look at that in no matter where they are in the office or who they are and collaborate together and go okay I'm free you're not um, I will go do that for you and everybody can make a decision at that point who takes care of that task and then they clear the tasks so that everybody else in the office knows that's no longer needed. But it looks, it just looks like a light panel, you know, a little buzzer thing on the wall, but it's virtual, it's, it's computerized. Is dentistry the biggest uh, part of, uh, I mean, is dentistry, um, you know, general dentistry, ortho, oral surgery, parapedo, is that bigger than say, I optometry, veterinary, others? I mean, or, or is dentistry your, your biggest market? Well, it's our yeah, it's, it's still our home base. So I would say at least 50% of our sales are still dentists. And then the other 50% are the other, in, are the other industries out there. And um, but, but we found that, yeah, everybody has this need and, and they don't necessarily, they get tired of their radios. They get tired of um, having to ma manage all of that and having a um, a network-based software system versus cloud-based also is what keeps it HIPAA secure. So you're not having to worry about, did that get out on the internet? Did I have a breach? You know, um, everything stays local on, on their own system so they can use it for whatever they need to. And what is the uh, pricing on this? <laughs> it's a, it's lifetime licensing. It's less than a thousand dollars and that's a one-time licensing you buy it one time for a thousand bucks and that's it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah because it doesn't have any main it doesn't need any maintain mm -hmm. main, maintenance essentially you just install the software on all the computers where people are communicating and just let them run with it because it's very intuitive they just figure out oh this is this says uh you know sally to op three and they just press the button that says sally to op three and sally comes to op three if they program it that way, everything is contextual. So you you add the help, help them add the context, or they figure it out. Offices are able to usually build this on their own. So um, well that that's the hardest business model because once you sell something for nine ninety five, your business starts to scratch again. You have to sell another one to go. That's why Netflix had a valuation <laughs> as high as Disney because Disney, you know, they'd invest a hundred million into a movie. They go do 300 million at the box office. They net up, you know, it was boom, bust, boom, bust. But Netflix mm -hmm. said, no, we're just going to get 10 bucks a month from everybody. So you had that guaranteed income. And, and right. if, um, if you don't have that, if the uh, wall street would rather you sign them up for $10 a month for, you know, 10 years. Agreed. Then get all the money up front. So why, mm -hmm. why do you stick to a feast famine business model? And instead of just taking their credit card, and saying on the first of the month of every month, we're going to ding it for, you know, mm -hmm. 10 bucks, 15 bucks, whatever. Um, you know, why, why do you do that? You got to give me a grand and then you're back to square one the minute you 
ding him for a grand. What do you mean back to square one? You well, once you made that sell, oh, our, oh, yeah. ourselves, right? Because well, once you made that sell, you you have no that. more revenue coming we in don't. for the we whole don't. future. Yeah, not from them. We don't need their we don't right. need their business anymore. Um, so my question to you is, which model do you prefer as a consumer? Well, I mean, I would rather buy it once and never deal with it again. You know, that's that, me. But that um, is that is why we do it is because we understand our consumers, and because this is um, a market that uh, is a very niche market. There's not. Uh, you know, not every medical practice wants to do it this way. Not every eye care practice, not every dental practice wants to do it this way. Um, it is sustainable because of word of mouth. As, as soon as one office puts it in one practice, they may have 30 practices. They may put it in all 30 of them. And that way it helps sustain our growth that way. And we're able to grow by word of mouth and, uh, and Google searches, of course. <laughs> So we've, um, we stopped using our walkie talkies, uh, that we, we loved them for a long time. Are you, are, are, is this replacing a lot of walkie talkies? Yes. We hear a lot of people saying I'm taking my plugs out, you know, they'll, they'll roll, roll with blue note for about a week and they're like, okay, time for the plugs. Everybody's taking them out and they're very happy and they don't, nobody looks back and they're like, this is doing the job that we need it to do. Okay. So be real specific. What's the difference between an office listening to you right now on the walkie talkie system versus the mm -hmm. blue note software system? Okay. It's really easy. One person in the office basically guides all of the, um, the, the, uh, tasks and they just set it up in the software and they're just there ready to use. In other words, they've created the protocol with, uh, radios. You have to sit down with everybody and say, okay, when you do this, I need you to do this. And when you do this, I need you to do that. And everybody has to understand that protocol. In other words, it's in here, it's all stored in here versus in the computer. The computer will store the workflow for you and it's already pre established. And then everybody just looks at it and goes, oh, I need this. And they just touch, touch a button and all of it is just intuitively there. So that's probably the biggest difference. Of, so, so like, uh, so for a 911 analogy, I call 911. Mm -hmm. the, the person answering it would be like my front desk. They're, they're, they're answering 911 call, but it's actually the dispatcher who decides who's going to respond to that call. Am I going to send to the fire department, please? You know, blah, blah. So, mm -hmm. so, the, so the receptionist answering the phone would be like the 911 operator, but the dispatcher is the one running the, the, the blue notes to decide, um, who's going to do what the blue note software. You said it's one person or they kind of like well, the, one person the, sets the system up, but once it's ready to go, it's a one-to-one -one or one-to-many as far as communications. In other words, uh, one person just has to get in their computer and know how to do the configuration in order to create the context for that particular office. They didn't have to tell everybody how to use it. It's just, and then what they do is they set up the software. And then once it's available for use, the doctor can basically use it to call for an assistant. The hygienist can use it to uh, probe, you know, call for probing. Front desk can use it to say, hey, here's the doorbell sound for, you know, hygiene three, your next patient is here. And hygiene three will have a different doorbell than maybe hygienist two. So um, those, those are what I'm talking about as far as one person sets up all of the uh, sounds and all of the uh, lights to make it unified for it throughout the office. Um, um, very interesting. There, there's a thread on this uh, going on right now on Dentaltown. It's a uh, um, inter-office messenger app. Question for IT software gurus. I'm looking for an inter-office messenger app. Um, and uh, it seems like this is, uh, um, it seems like the trend is going away from uh, the walkie talkie days mm -hmm. uh, back when Motorola, I, may, I I always wondered, you know, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. That's where Motorola was huge. I didn't and, know that. And I didn't know if that was, uh, um, um, what, why, why do you think um, the walkie talkie uh, is being replaced. I mean, like I say, I, we stop using them in our office. Why, why do you mm -hmm. think walkie talkies are being replaced, uh, by other means, um, including, uh, your husband's uh, company, um, blue note software, blue notes software, by the, by the <laughs> way, where does that come from? Blue notes software. 
What's the story behind that? <laughs> it, well, the first iteration of the software were actually blue notes. They were blue and they were notes and they popped up on the screen and they were always blue. So we're like, let's just call it blue notes. And there's still a lot of that blue element in the software. Um, so, but the reason why, uh, I, I really don't know why people are, you know, not using their radios as much. They just say they're tired of the chatter. The front desk will say, you know what? I'm trying to talk to the person in front of me. I don't want that to also have to be listening in on a conversation in my ear. Same thing for back office. They don't want, uh, patients to listen in on the little quick chirps that they're having to tell people. Um, that's probably the, the biggest thing that I see, but you know, we don't hear from the offices where the radios are successful. So there are still a lot of offices that are enjoying the benefits of, of radios. Don't get me wrong. I really think they are the, the, um, most intuitive way because you don't have to go and buy any software. Everybody knows how to use their mouth. Everybody knows how to use their brain, right? So uh, there's their uh, radios are definitely, uh, you know, well, what, what, still what there. The, so why did you guys give up the radios? That would be my question. Um, well, I want to go back to um, the why I went digital to begin with and got rid of paper charts. It's because okay. I had a protocol that, you know, um, because I knew like, uh, like dentists would use an electrosurge because because I, I had associates that would use them. You know what I mean? Hmm. And they would, um, they didn't like the tissue around there. So they get the electrode and pack cord and everything. And you would hear them tell their dental friends that they have no post-operative discomfort, but you would hear those patients calling in begging for pain meds and Vicodin and refills and all this kind of stuff. So I, I, I made this protocol that, that if someone called, you had to enter the note in the chart. Well, they, they, well, they wouldn't do that. First, they couldn't reach it. So I got them longer deals and I got them cordless phones and I got him headsets, but I couldn't get them to keep pulling paper charts. So it was 1999 mm -hmm. when I realized, okay, well, you know what you got to do now? Just get rid of the damn chart. If you get rid of the damn chart, you'll solve this problem. So I got rid mm -hmm. of all the charts. So now um, you call up, I have to pull up your chart, right? And then, you know, so I entered that. And, and when I uh, go in through the office, um, the other thing is when I would ask for something and they'd have to leave the room, I would, I would leave the room too. And I'd go to the office manager and say, okay, I'm doing a root canal. This is like the thousandth time I've done a root canal. And when I ask for this thing that I always ask for every time I do a root canal, which I've done a thousand, thousand, thousand times, why does she have why to leave not? the room? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, would you like to be in the middle of a surgery? You're, you're in the middle of brain surgery. And they asked for, give me the, the standard instrument. Oh, I got to leave the room. I got to go. So, so, so I would set a protocol rule that when I sat down to do surgery, because everything in dentistry is done hands on, we work with our hands. It's mm -hmm. all surgery on a live patient. You're not leaving the room. And if you're leaving the room, I'm leaving the room because I'm going to go get your boss and let her know that somebody, you know, there's some failure of, of communication, but when you keep setting the bar high, eventually you, you don't need it. And, um, I think that, um, I think that we got so digital. And then I also think with, um, using the, um, Oh, what's a, um, the, the, uh, saliva suction light thing in your mouth. The, uh, mm -hmm, the iso dry, the, I, the, the isolate. Mm -hmm. um, and instead of your assistant sitting there the whole time just retracting and suctioning, um, which didn't do it for me because when you're older, you need a lot more light. And, mm -hmm. you know, so that, that thing, it just lights up the stage. It's better. Um, I think they just, they just really didn't need it anymore. I mean, the assistants had free hands. They weren't with the isolate. They, they could, um, you know, use their computer. They could use email. They could use other things. But I liked the, what I like most about the walkie talkies though, I could always hear what they were saying in your ear and you mm -hmm. never thought I could hear. So I mm -hmm. always thought it was great. Um, you know, <laughs> I could, I could hear them talking about me on the deal. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you know, don't send him in there because he'll, he'll do this, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so for me, it was a great form of communication just to know what all my staff would say if they thought kind I couldn't the back, hear. The uh, back chatter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and you figure out things like if, um, if anything is seating any, we only have eight ops. So if they seated anything in room nine, I always knew it was food. So then I knew to get the hell out of that room quick and get back there to the break room. 
uh, before mm-hmm. someone else ate all the good food. Uh-huh. Uh, but but yeah, they my staff yeah. they they voted it down one day and it was dead. But I mean, but it was a big part of our practice for twenty years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what are you guys using now? God, you know, I don't even know. I think oh, well. I think they're using. They just the, say go here and. Um, no, I, I, just, I think I think they're. I mean, it, it's something on the computer. Okay. Uh, so, and that's really what a lot of things are evolving to. Um, a lot of people are using um, the unsecure messaging that, that are cloud-based. Those are, uh, there, there's not really any of them that you're not going to pay more than about, oh, $50, $60 a month for that aren't HIPAA compliant. So do keep that in mind. Things like um, uh, and anything cloud-based. I don't even like Skype. <laughs> is is not HIPAA compliant. Even though they're not using it for patient data, the fact of is the, the big concern with HIPAA security is not whether or not you're using it. It's that, is it a vector? Is it a potential vector? And can, will Skype back you up if you ever get audited? They won't. They won't say this was not the source of the, of the, of the breach. And at that point, you've shown a vulnerability. Uh, you can get a slap with fines. So definitely anything cloud-based, you want to be cautious. Make sure that it is something that you are paying for and that they've assigned a BAA with you. Um, but that's what's right, nice. That's another reason why the price point of something that's locally hosted is um, a one-time fee is because there's not any maintenance needed um, because it is staying you know, on your network and it is uh, not letting anybody be able to know when there's cookies in the break room, right? <laughs> well, I was, uh, I was very sad when, um, uh, Microsoft bought, um, LinkedIn and Skype because, um, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's one of the lowest quality companies. And I know everybody loves Bill Gates cause he's the richest guy and everything. But I mean, I mean, I grew up with Bill Gates and every time he releases software, uh, let's say you bought it for $300. You'd have to pay someone $900 to come out here and fix all the bugs, the patches. And and every programmer I have as a patient says they 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 know they release crappy software riddled with bugs. And then, then you had Steve Jobs over there with iPhone that would dot every I, cross every T, and just release perfect software. Then you had Bill Gates over there just, I mean, he made a used Chrysler look like a Mercedes Benz. And when, and the minute he bought LinkedIn, I said, okay, well now, now LinkedIn will be garbage and he bought Skype. So yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, I mean, I know, I, I mean, it's, it's embarrassing when the richest people in your country care nothing about quality and they, they, you know, um, they, well, it's just money, 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 sell, sell, sells, be a billionaire. Uh, whereas Jobs actually said, no, I want this thing to look nice. I want it not to have bugs. I want it to run great. I mean, I mean, Jobs Jobs, pretty much made a Mercedes-Benz iPhone. Mm-hmm. And then Microsoft said, well, we're going to make a, do- a, a 1964 Dodge Dart. It, it, we'll, we'll make software so bad you wish you had a Dodge Dart from mm-hmm. 1960. So... So yeah, it didn't surprise me. LinkedIn, Skyped, and uh, everything. You, you bring up Steve Jobs, and I, I think my uh, thought process on him is I, I, I'm trying to imagine what he would think of if he were to go into any one of America's waiting rooms these days and look around and see everybody looking on their mobile devices that his company pioneered. What would he think about that culture of everybody staring at their phones? Um, you know, you, know, you have to be cautious of how you're building society sometimes and not re- and realize that maybe you, it is mostly for good, but there's just so much instances I, I'm hearing of, um, you know, just uh, anxiety that's being caused by the, you know, device It's like, I don't have my device and I, and I'm guilty of it from time to time myself. So I do understand that, uh, you know, it's sometimes the, Ha, just not having money being the object is not always enough. Yeah, but I, I, I've, um, I read a whole bunch on that, um, that open loop deal where, you know, I think after jobs, a lot of people figured out the physical, like, like they did on TV, like, um, you know, there'd be a really interesting scene at the movie, but then they break for commercial. So they would leave it open. So you'd have to stay through the commercial to see how it closed. Mm-hmm. Stay tuned. When we come back, we'll tell you. Did she really, you know, what did she do? So that open loop method. And then, and so, 
I think they have so, um, they understood the addictedness um, mm -hmm. uh, levers on it, but they manipulated them 100%. Like, for instance, you're a social animal and you have amygdala. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when somebody dings you, like, like they always say, like I, on all these apps, they want to be able to notify you of a message because they know if they send you any type of a signal that's from another homo sapien and you're a social animal, you, you, you're, you have to see what, what that's about. Well, they know that's addicted. They know you're driving mm -hmm. to work and you hear that ding and you're checking it as you plow into the car in front of you. I mean, so, so, so much of that stuff is, is in a uh, intentional, but I went, but last weekend, um, there was a big story uh, where uh, hundreds of dental offices uh, were hacked into across the nation and uh, hit with ransomware. And I was wondering uh, what you thought of all that. Well, yeah, I followed it just on the sidelines. Um, essentially, it looked like it was, again, you, you don't know necessarily where the the threats can be they can come from anywhere and essentially if you don't patch all of the vulnerabilities because you could have you know P, piece a of your software piece b of your software piece three secure but if you've got one little piece and you can and the hacker can thread through all three of those like safeguards they've got a way in and it's i, I don't know the specifics of how that virus um, or the ransomware got onto everybody's machines, but it was fortunately it was resolved very quickly. The little ecosystem of hey, we will uh, bring in our experts that have that can get this code from the hacker just fine. There's there's this third party, uh, as far as what I what I know, um, a, a whole ecosystem of uh, negotiators that go in between like the um, the person trying to uh, resolve the ransomware and the uh, hackers themselves. And they're, they're getting little cuts of all of this system too. So um, you wanna talk about dark web ecosystems. That's one that's uh, I would never ever wanna be a part of. Well, you but, know what, uh, I, it made me wonder, um, okay, so this, uh, the Digital Dental Record is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Wisconsin Dental Association. And so basically, um, um, I felt sorry for my homies because they're, you know, it hit about 400 offices. They're pretty mm -hmm. much all in Wisconsin. They're mm -hmm. thinking, well, I got a nonprofit Wisconsin Dental Association. I pay my dues. They're looking out for me. This is their own uh, wholly owned subsidiary, the Digital Dental mm -hmm. Record. They, they do everything right. Mm -hmm. And then they end up having everything go wrong. And, it made, and the first thing I thought was I was talking to a guy out here who's with the uh, the Arizona Dental Association. I said, "Man, that that's that's not a service I would get into." I mean, I mean, I mean, you're not talking about mm -mm. some little kid in the basement hacking in when he's between Fortnite and you know and uh, whatever video game he's on. I mean, mm -hmm. th these are. I mean, China China said uh, it was a long time ago. They uh, they announced they had over one hundred thousand people in their um, uh, AI, um, military hacking, you know, um, the North Koreans, the Russians. I mean, these, these you're not playing with amateurs on this stuff. I mean, I, I, I just I just don't think, I mean, like on Dentaltown, I mean, ever since we started Dentaltown, I have adamantly said, there's been a bunch of reasons why we should take your credit card, store your credit card, you know, do all these things for it. And I'm like, no, but you know, mm -hmm. you know what I don't want to have? I, I don't want to have a whole bunch of dentist credit cards on my computer. Cause guess what happens? Somebody's going to get in there and then all the dentists are going to say, Howard, um, they stole my credit card from your site. So would you, mm -hmm. would you and your husband and, um, and blue notes, uh, blue note software advise dental societies that this business is kind of out of their league. That the business of, um, managing your own, your own secu internet security out of your league. Um, and cloud and cloud storage. <laughs> it, it, it is surprising how, how many offices do their own it. Um, and whenever we hear that, I would definitely, I throw, I, 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 I just, it's a hail Mary to hope that nothing is going to be there. That's causing damage to them. I feel more for them than anything, but yes, I would say 
having IT professionals managing all of that for you, making sure that the um, remote access uh, software is secure, because I think that's really what the, the um, hack was. Uh, that was the vulnerability, was the remote access on those uh, uh, dental offices. So uh, just make sure all of all of the bases are covered and that they have uh, secured any um, any places that you could get targeted. So, and I'm not an IT person. Again, I'm a hygienist uh, that kind of got into working in uh, working on the computer side uh, just by proxy. Um, but it's been enjoyable. It's been really neat seeing how uh, offices, just their cultures and getting to, to help them expand their culture and say, hey, look, this is how we do things in our office. This is why we do things. This is what's important in our office. And, and basically making being a glue in their office so that they can all express themselves to one another so that they get their jobs done and they all get to go home at the same time every day, you know, and not run behind because they've had miscommunication. Um, you, you were posting uh, the other day on um, bonus systems for hygienists and you said that you preferred the BAM bonuses to departments. Oh. <laughs> uh, but, but, um, but what do you, what do you, what do you think about um, hygiene, hygiene, pay? I mean, I mean, you only manage people, time, and money, and mm -hmm. um, incentives work. That we started this podcast with insurance. That if, if a person doesn't have a, fi a co-payment, they have no skin in the game. So they don't care about the price, the cost, the, the, mm -hmm. the craziness. When, when, when countries brag that, oh, I had a, I had a hysterectomy and I didn't even have a bill. Okay, well, you know the system is completely broken because the patient the most important part of this whole system doesn't even know that they didn't even look at their numbers. You show me a dental office or a restaurant who doesn't know their numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's completely broken. And having any system where it encourages people not to see the numbers, well, you're, you're not bragging about your system. You're bragging about how broken it is. but, but you've been a mm -hmm. hygienist for many moons and many nights. Um, what do you think of bonus systems and 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 specifically towards hygiene department? Mm -hmm. So we we played with a couple of bonus systems, um, and, and you know we've done the grab bags. Different offices did different things, um, but I think everybody in our office we did the the BAM bonus um, where it was a group effort and essentially. Um, everybody maxed out their licensing. So you think hygienists, you know, they, we, we are licensed to scale teeth and, um, you know, the dentist could scale teeth too, but we would never ask the dentist to do that. So anything that's not scaling teeth, you delegate that to somebody else in the office. Um, and that's how you uh, essentially increase your efficiency. Um, I'm a big advocate. I uh, did accelerated with, with accelerated hygiene. I did it for many, many years. Um, found it to be very rewarding because I could see patients not worry about necessarily the clock, but not worrying about, okay, um, how long is the doctor going to take so that I can get my room turned over? I never had to turn over rooms. I never had to um, clean uh, you know, instruments or even go seat my patients or dismiss them. None of that uh, is a factor when you're accelerating your schedule and letting uh, hygiene assistants essentially carry the, that part of the load for you. But that's when everybody in the office deserves to be part of a bonus system. I don't think that hygienists should be, uh, you know, singled out because we're producers per se. Everybody in the office is a producer and they have a value to getting a patient to say yes to treatment, to getting same day dentistry done, to getting all of the uh, things that are going to keep that office in business and thriving and helping to serve more people. So uh, anything that it takes in order to, um, you know, increase those, those, the, so I guess BAM bonus is you, you, you set a threshold. So let's say a hundred thousand dollars is your goal for the, for the, um, uh, for the month. And so if you get under that threshold, as far as your production, you know, your adjusted production is concerned, you, there's no bonus, but anything above that, the uh, whole office gets to join in a percentage of that. So if you made uh, $115,000, the office gets to split that 15,000 bonus, you know, however way that the owners seem fit.
And who is the author of the BAM bonus? Uh, BAM being uh, BAM base amount to meet. Uh, who, who, who would you say is the um, the the uh, uh, the um, author? Do, I don't know who the author is. Do you? Um, is it Denise uh, Ciardello? Do you know her? I don't know. We we worked through a uh, quantum leap of is uh, the practice management that introduced us to that. It's been many years ago. I couldn't tell you all the details and the people involved, but uh, they were the ones who introduced us to that uh, that type of bonusing system. And it was uh, it was very uh, very enlightening when we did it. We didn't do it for very long. Um, everybody in our office was salaried, and we were happy with our salaries. So even though I'm I, you know preaching the BAM bonus, um, I think that uh, it really. Uh, it can get you over humps and hurdles. And I think that's what we needed during that time of our, we had some growth that we needed to do and that helped. Pa, huh, it's, uh, um, yeah, um, I got, um, I, I think that's Denise Cerradello who's out near you. Uh, oh. she, she's from Texas on uh, GT, okay. GTS gurus. Do you remember her GTS gurus? I, I don't <laughs> global team solutions, practice okay. management, um, but, but, but what's funny about that is, uh, you like that. Uh, but my gosh, most of all my homies listening to you right now, if they went back home and, and thought they were going to tell their hygienist, uh, that they were going to do, um, what, what do you call it? Expanded, uh, accelerated, accelerated hygiene. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, 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 they wouldn't even go to work tomorrow. They'd, they'd be so afraid to go to work to face, uh, their, their staff. And, mm-hmm. and yet you liked it. Why, why do you, why do you think it's so, um, to me, it makes sense. I mean, as a dentist, I don't want to go out mm-hmm. there and seat the patient. I don't want to mm-hmm. set up the room. I don't want to do all this stuff. I want to go in there. In fact, I'm such a brat that if I walk in the room and they're not leaning back and the deal's on, I say, um, they're not leaning back and the lights on. Look at them like, you know, are, are you not ready? Do you want me to come back or you want, I'll go do a hygiene check? I mean, I, I don't want to go into every room and the first thing I do the rest of my life is lean the chair back mm-hmm. and then put the light on. I mean, right. I, I want to walk in there and ready to jumping jack flash. I don't know why I would go to four years of hygiene to set up the room mm-hmm. and then go get the patient, seat the mm-hmm. patient. I, I, I wouldn't want to do anything that the dental assistant could do. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I see, I definitely see it that way um, that, you know, all of those things are, they take away from your um, mental, uh, I don't know, str- it just, it's one more thing to do. You have okay, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. What if you only have to do t- step two, step three, and step four? It's like just that the, the mental processes involved and the, uh, and the certainty of knowing exactly at 3.30, I'm going to go see this patient and I can chat them up for 30 minutes. I can clean their teeth. I can ask about their home care. I don't have to do anything else. The x-rays are ready up on the screen. The doctors already uh, looked at the x-rays. They've already suggested PAs. All of that happened before I even came to the uh, into the operatory to, you know, provide uh, my preventive services. And of, I, I don't understand. I mean, I do understand the fact that, you know, the, the thought of seeing, you know, 12 patients a day 13, 14, 15 patients a day, up to 20 patients a day, it can, it's exhausting to think about it. But on the same hand, you're seeing more people, you're making a difference in pe- more people's lives when you're doing that. And you're, you're still in the hour, office the same eight hours. That didn't change. You're still there. You're just maximizing your abilities. So um, how many year, um, how many years you've been doing this? That I was a hygiene that yeah. I was did accelerated hygiene, um, two thousand and three from then to twenty sixteen. So quite a few years. And how do you see um, how do you see the dental market going now um, that you've been in it this long? I mean, um, you're you're in Dallas. You're seeing mm-hmm. uh, DSOs come and go. Um, you're mm. you're seeing a, a lot of changes in the market. How does this? Um, how how do you see this? How do I see the acceleration of well, um, just, just how hygiene? How, how was the the DSO and corporate dentistry changing um, hygiene? A lot of the DSOs don't even hire hygienists. 
or I shouldn't say a lot, there are a few. Um, they essentially let the doctors hire, over hire doctors, make the doctors work really, really hard, um, and then have assistants doing the final polish. Um, I, I find that they're the ones that are hiring the hygienists. Um, I can't speak from any experience because I've never worked with a DSO. Um, but it does seem like that they seem to be very numbers oriented and trying to uh, exaggerate uh, periodontal needs. So that would be one reason. That would be the big red flag for me. It's like as long as they're, the, the periodontal needs are not being exaggerated in a DSO, a hygienist uh, doesn't really, the, 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 the time uh, requirements that they're asking these hygienists to work on are, uh, I think, very, uh, it, it, you can choose that if, that's, if that makes sense to you. I don't see any ethical reason not to work for a DSO, as long as they're not having you falsify uh, treatment, doing excessive care. Well, the bottom line is there's only three DSOs that are publicly traded and three for three of the publicly traded do not have hygienists. So um, what you're saying that you see the trend uh, not doing it, I mean, it's more than a trend, it's factual. By the time they get to being publicly traded, zero out of three hire hygienists. Mm -hmm. And if you go to uh, listen to anybody uh, consult to DSOs, they, the first thing they'll say is, well, you can't pay a hygienist $40 an hour to do a cleaning that's $50 from an insurance company. Right. So then you say, okay, well, here's some middle ground. Well, instead of paying a hygienist $40 an hour, we'll pay a hygienist $40 an hour and an assistant 20. So that's 60 and have them do two rooms. So now we're mm -hmm. down to $30 an hour. And guess who doesn't like that the most? The hygienist. The hygienist. So it's like, okay, <laughs> right. hygienist. So all three DSOs that are publicly traded have zero. The uh -huh. other DSOs, they 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 know their numbers, and they're not going to pay uh -huh. you forty dollars to do a fifty dollar cleaning inside uh -huh. a facility with sixty five percent overhead. So the next option would be accelerated hygiene, and uh -huh. they and they just like, well, I, I don't want to hear that. So then, so so what? So what does that leave you? I mean, where how do how do you see this? Well, I definitely see that the hygienists are kind of in a, between a rock and a hard place. It's like, if you don't want to work at all, well, fine, we'll just hire, you know, we can't afford you, period. Um, and then, like you said, that if, if hygienists are not willing to uh, use their time a little differently and not uh, work, you know, one hygienist, one chair, they are limiting their uh, affordability in uh practices that are taking reduced rates for the uh, preventive care. So they really, I, I, I think that unfortunately for those hygienists that don't want to do accelerated uh, hygiene, um, I'm, I'm sounding like I'm not much of a uh, advocate for them, but there are, there are definitely people, dental offices that want that continuity where a hygienist um, you know, the, the patients stay with one hygienist, the whole visit or one person. And that's probably the, uh, the key to the hygienist keeping that, uh, autonomy is I saw this patient from soup to nuts, this whole visit, we didn't pass, pass the, you know, pass them from uh, front desk to hygienist, assistant to hygienist to doctor, you know, that I took care of them the whole, the whole visit. Hmm. That is, uh, that is, um, very interesting. So, um, any, um, we went over an hour, um, anything else that you're, uh, passionate about that you wished, uh, we would have talked about today? Um, you know, I think we really covered everything pretty well. I have a little list here and you, you got me through them. So thank you for that. And thank you for having me on the show. Well, it's an honor. I've, uh, I've been, uh, Fan years. I mean, my God, you've been on Dental Town. Uh, I'm trying to trying to uh, think. Um, here, let me uh, uh, pull it up. You you joined Dental Town uh, back in 2004, and that that was 15 years ago. And you've posted 1,600 times. I feel like you're my sister. I mean, I mean, I mean, really. I mean, when you read someone. 1,600 posts in 15 years. I mean, I I know where you stand. I mean, it's not like 
You know, it's like it, it would. Be, I know this is. This is be, all repeat. <laughs> yeah, it would be hard for you to say something and shock me any more than it would mm-hmm. have any of my five sisters to say something. But a uh, mm-hmm. big fan of yours. Uh, love your passion. Uh, love reading dentalbuzz.com um, for just unique. I mean, you're a dental humorist. Uh, you think outside the box. I mean, it, it's you're really an amazing journalist in dentistry. I, I wouldn't even call you a humorist. I, I'd call you. Um, a dental humorous journalist of dentistry. Uh, love dental buzz. Love everything about it. Love everything about you. Thank you so much, Trish, for coming on the show today. It was an honor to podcast you. Thank you so much. It's been an honor for me too.